Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much tonight. We bless your name because you brought us together so that you can purge and purify your church and so that you can empower us leaders in the church to do what you have called us to do. I pray, Lord, that tonight your anointing will come upon every brother and every sister here tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray, O Lord, you'll use us as mighty instruments in your hand so that we'll build a pure church, a righteous church, a church on fire, and a church that stands on the truth of the word of God in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that from all that will be hearing tonight, everything that happened to the church we are studying tonight, we pray, Lord, you'll turn everything into positive encouragement to every one of us to march forward in the strength of the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said a good amen. You know, if you it's getting late in the night and you are likely to have the tendency to sleep and doze if you don't shout an amen to wake yourself up. When you see I shout, I wake myself up while I'm here. You cannot go to sleep when you are shouting like I'm shouting. And so if you want to keep yourself awake like I'm awake when I say in Jesus' name or I saw something affirmative, then you say amen for your own sake and for the sake of the people that are dozing. So that uh, you know you wake up those people that are sleeping around you. God will bless you tonight in Jesus' name. I did that one to test you. We're looking at Revelation chapter two, and in Revelation chapter two we're looking at verses eighteen through to twenty-nine. Here is the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, and He gave this message to a particular church. This is the first church we're looking at now. We look at the first one, the church in Ephesus. We looked at the second one, and that was the church in Smyrna. We have looked at the third one, that was the church in Pergamos. Now we come to the fourth one, and here, the Lord has a long message for this particular church. And it goes all the way through from verse 18 to verse 29. I start reading with you. And it says, And unto the angel of the church in Tatira, write, These things says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnt and like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. The Lord always started with commendation, with a note of praise, a good God, a loving God. No matter how bad things are, the Lord Jesus Christ will still look for something to praise, for something to commend. And so as he came to this church, sending the message to the church, you can see, in the message of this church, the desire of the Lord and the expectation of the Lord for the church is very, very clear. He wants the church to be holy. He wants the church to be pure. He wants the church to be spotless as every bridegroom expects of his bride. As every husband wants the wife to be pure to be chaste, to be trustworthy, to be dependable, to be faithful in such a way that in the same way the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, the husband of the church, the bridegroom of the church, he expects his bride, the church, the people of God to be holy, to be pure, and to be spotless. In fact, he sacrificed himself. And he shed his own blood to cleanse the church, to sanctify the church, so that the church might be a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Think about it. The expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ 
the head of the church. And the reason why Jesus Christ gave himself and surrendered himself and went to the cross of Calvary and shed his precious blood for the individual believers is so that the collection, the assembly, the congregation, the fellowship of those believers will be pure, will be chaste, will be holy, will be without spot and without wrinkle. In fulfilling the vision of Christ and the desire of Christ, the leadership of the early church, they dealt with sin. And the stood against teachers with wrong, erroneous, or sinful influence on the church. The leadership was intolerant of sin. Intolerant of sin. Intolerant of sin. They could be tolerant of young people. They could be tolerant of different tribes. They could be tolerant of immaturity or infanthood. They could be tolerant of a lot of things. But when it comes to the problem of sin, the leadership of the early church was intolerant of sin. And they were intolerant of the teachers of impurity. Those teachers of impurity, whenever, whenever, whenever they were discovered, they were removed without wasting time. And look at it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading to you from verse 11. 1 Corinthians 5, 11. And such, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 11. But now I have preaching unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not to eat. Did you see how firm and emphatic they were? Whenever there was any shade, any size of sin, they dealt with it precisely, promptly, peremptorily. That is, definitely without looking back. That if there was anyone in the midst of the people of God that was known to be a sinner, a backslider, and was known to be somebody, a drunkard, or a confectious fellow, or a fornicator, or an adulterer, or somebody that had a visible, external, recognizable sin in his life. They removed him. In verse 13, But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The wicked person they were talking about here was a young man in the fellowship, in the church at Corinth, that had gone to have a moral relationship with the wife of the father. And Paul the apostle said, you continue worshipping, you continue singing, you continue celebrating, you continue taking the Lord's Supper, you continue having the gifts of the Spirit in operation, and then you are dancing around the real issue. When you come together, and my Spirit with you, deal with that sin. That's how the early church dealt with sin. Without compromise. In Titus chapter 1, in Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. Titus chapter 1, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped. Take the microphone away from them. Their mouths must be stopped. Take them away from the pulpit. Their mouth must be stopped. Silence them that they do not teach such the scripture or they do not preach in the assembly of the people of God. Silence them. Muscle their mouth. Whose mouth must be stopped? Who subvert all houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucas sake. 
you will see then that the early church will not compromise for sin. The early church stood firm. Unfortunately, this church in Tatira, they had many good points for commendation, but the leader in that church and the leadership team supporting that leader, they were so tolerant of evil and they were so permissive that full-scale idolatry and full-scale immorality infected many lives without check, without control. The leadership allowed a self-appointed prophetess. Please understand, the Lord is not, was not against and is not against real Christian women. The Lord Jesus Christ appreciates the grace of God, the love of God, the tenderness and the meekness and the gifts of God in the lives of Christian women. And you need to read Luke chapter 8 and you need to read John, the gospel according to St. John and see the beautiful, wonderful, holy, righteous women that minister to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to understand that when Jesus rose from the dead, he, he told that woman, he appeared to the woman first. And then that because of their devotion, because of their love, because of their, of their affection for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said to those women, go and tell my disciples that I am risen. He gave them the message of resurrection and the message of power and the message of life to go and tell the men. And you remember that woman at the well, although her life had been bad, when she came to the Lord Jesus Christ and grace turned her around and grace transformed her and grace did the miraculous work in her. She went to the city and she said, come, see a man that told me everything I ever did is this not the Christ. And God used that woman as much as God used Philip and brought the whole city unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they heard, they said, now we know. Not only because of what you have said, we have heard him ourselves and we know that this is the Savior of the world. Jesus has nothing against righteous, sanctified women. But anyone that goes into sin and influences other people to sin, the Lord is against them. And you know in the churches that we have studied, we studied the church at Ephesus. And the people there, following the doctrine of Balaam, obviously, those were men. And the people, the disciples, the Nicolaitans, those were men. And Jesus said, I hate their evil deeds and their evil doctrine. Not because they are men, not because they are women. God has nothing against men. God has nothing against women. But when a man goes into evil and then influences other people to do evil, God is against that man. If, on the other hand, it happens to be a woman that embraces evil, accepts evil, and then also influences other people to do evil, God will be against that woman. Not because she's a woman, not because she's a man, but because of the evil. And so when you hear this, don't look at all men as disciples of Balaam, and don't look at all women as evil people. No. We're just, we're just looking at Scripture. And we're interpreting scripture. And we know that there are few, few men and few, very few women that are not following the Lord in the church, in the church in Tatira. And he led people astray. And Jesus, tender and loving, he wanted to make it clear that that leadership in the church in Tatira had allowed a self-appointed prophetess to teach false doctrine and to cause many to backslide without restraint and without discipline. The fear of man, the fear of a woman in this case with corrupting influence, silence them. The leadership couldn't talk. They couldn't deal with the issue. That woman, the fear of that woman in the church in Tatira weakened the spiritual muscles and distorted their perception of the holiness of God and diverted their attention to pleasing people rather than pleasing God. They fixed their mind on avoiding present pain rather than fixing their mind 
on escaping eternal, everlasting judgment, wrath, indignation, and suffering in hell fire. And that's the reason we're looking at this church. We want to see what the Lord has for us. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, commendation of progress by Jesus. Anywhere he sees progress in your life, in your family, in your local church, in our church at large, he will commend, he will praise, he will appreciate, he will encourage. Commendation of progress by Jesus. Number two, corruption 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 through the perversion of jezebel corruption through the perversion of jezebel point number three demand and promise for the just command and promise command and promise for the just let's go to point number one and see commendation of progress by jesus first of all in every letter jesus christ introduced himself and as you look at verse 18, you'll see what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. And unto the church, unto the angel of the church in Tatira, write, These things says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. As Jesus introduced himself here, he established his authority. Before speaking to the church. And sometimes if people don't know who you are. If they don't know what the heavenly father has appointed you to be. Has appointed you to do. You don't have enough spiritual credentials for us to be able to listen to you. Because we don't know what God has sent you to do. We don't know what God has appointed you to do. It is when the appointment. When the credentials are clear. That the divine anointing authority is upon your life and you have the approval and the license from the Lord to go speak to the people of God. Then we listen. The Lord Jesus Christ cleared that issue of his credential. And he said he gave his divine credentials as the son of God not the son of man he introducing himself to this church he didn't say this is what the son of man says no he uses the other title the son of god because the son of man that emphasizes his humiliation a man of sorrows acquainted with grief and we saw him smitten of god and he carried our sorrows. He carried our blame. He carried our punishment. And we know that all our iniquities were laid on him. That's the son of man. The title son of man emphasizes his humiliation. His sympathy with us. His compassion for us. But the son of God emphasizes his divinity. His divine authority. As God who does not tolerate sin, but as a God, as angry deity, to judge sin in severity. That's why he said, this is what the Son of God is saying. He has eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet are like fine brass. What he's saying is he has piercing eyes, penetrating eyes searching eyes like laser that when he looks like this he sees very deep beyond what the x-ray can see the one beyond what those laser rays of light can pierce and penetrate eyes like a flame of fire and when there is sin or evil or any blemish or spot anywhere that cannot be veiled, covered with religious activities. His eyes behold the hidden things of the soul. And then he talks about his feet. His feet are strong, ready to trample down on repentant sinners. You see, as you look at this, you know that Jesus Christ is the one that is so holy. 
and is declared unto us to be the Son of God by the Spirit of holiness. In Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Romans 1, verse 3, concerning his Son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. When he introduced himself as the Son of God, he was saying that now I look at that church and I'm not looking at the church now as somebody that is so gentle and so tender and so nice and so meek and so lowly. I'm looking at the church. The church in its purity. The eyes of the Lord. The piercing eyes of the Lord. Searching. Penetrating. And looking at it. Wanting to see any sin, any blemish, any spot. That's why when he introduced himself to this church, he says, this is he that is speaking to this church in Tatira, the son of God. And when it says he has this speech to thrash and tread and crush on repentant sinners, he's introducing himself as a judge because there was something to judge in that church. I want there is something to judge in your life. When there is something blameworthy in your life. When there is a hidden sin, hidden blemish, hidden spot in your life. And the piercing eyes of Jesus Christ pierces through, penetrates, and looks at that sin. And then he says, what follows my searching, penetrating, piercing eyes is a feet that crushes, that treads the wine press of the wrath of God. Then you know what is going to follow the disclosure of the blemish, of the sin, of the evil, of the corruption, the pollution within. What is going to follow will be the judgment, fierce, terrible, terrifying, fearful judgment of God. In John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I'm reading to you from verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. You see what the Lord is saying here. It's telling us that when he looks at the church and there is something to judge, there is something that the Lord is saying, I am not pleased with this. That is saying, notwithstanding, I have this, I have this, I have that against you. Then you know that the judgment is coming from him. And it's going to be very firm. Look at verse 25 of that same John chapter 5. It says, Verily, verily, certainly, certainly, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given unto the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also. In fact, because he's the son of man. Because he's born the punishment for us. And he has invited us to come and take the grace and the mercy and the love of God. And the forgiveness of God and the salvation of God. And we refuse and we reject. Now, he has the right. Having given the final sacrifice and he has shed his blood, if you reject that, he has the right and the authority to bring you to judgment. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, as John the beloved saw the vision of the glorified Christ, here is part of what he saw. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14. And his head and his ears, chapter 1, verse 14, were white like wool, 
and white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto brass, as if they burnt in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 11, looking at the description of Jesus Christ. And when, when you see that this is your Lord, this is your Master, this is your Savior. You've seen him before in his gentleness, and his lowliness, and his humility. You've seen him before in his love, in his mercy, in his grace. You've seen him before in giving invitation, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Then you are going to see now another side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you're not seeing him now as a gentle savior. You're seeing him as a firm, uncompromising judge of all the earth. In Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 11, Revelation 19 verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. That's Jesus Christ fighting, warring in a battle and judging. His eyes were as a flame of fire and his head was on his head many crowns. And he had a name reaching that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture deep in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he might smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of, a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his tie a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one that now came to this Thessalonian church. And I was going to tell them about their deeds, about their works, about their activities, about commendable things and then things to be corrected. What did he say to them in commending them? In Revelation chapter 2 verse 19. Revelation chapter 2 verse 19. I know thy works and charity, that's love, and service, and faith, and thy patience, once again, and thy works, the second time, and the last to be more than the first. Could anything be wrong with a church like this, a church that was making progress? That even the Lord Jesus Christ, in looking at the activities and the progress and uh, the effect and the influence and the impact of this church in the community, he said, I know your works. And talking about love, charity, I know you demonstrate your love one to the other. And you have this milk of human tenderness and affection. That amongst you, you are able to minister to one another in love and charity. And I know your service, your service to God, and your service to one another. I know it. I cannot overlook the good things I see in your life, in your families, in your midst, in your church. And then he says, I know your faith. Your faith. When he talks about their faith, in a way they still believe that Jesus was the son of God. They still believe the, the doctrines in a way. Only that when it came to practice, when it came to dealing with sin, they were kind of timid about that. They were easily intimidated. They were fearful about that. When it comes to dealing with unrighteousness, and that's when they were very slow. But when it comes to faith, believing that God can do anything, believing that Jesus Christ, with him all things are possible. He can heal. He can save. He can deliver. He can do anything you want him to do. All problems, mountains, he can take out of your life. He said, I know your faith. But when it comes to being firm, 
on the sin that touches the very heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, they, that's where they were lacking. That's why, where they were wanting. He said, I know your patience. Very patient. One, one, they were patient with people. Patient with people. And some, patience is good. Patience is good. But sometimes we can carry that patience very, very far. You see the problem in this church? Who knows? You see their patience carried very far. When somebody came to the pastor, to the leader in the church and said, Jezebel there is calling herself a prophetess. And she's not among our women leaders. We know the women leaders were appointed. We know sister so-and-so. We know sister so-and-so. We know sister so-and-so. She is not even waiting for us to evaluate her before she will call herself a prophetess. We know the dependable sisters in the fellowship. We know those sisters that will teach them the way of God and the word of God. And we know they're good examples. But this woman, Jezebel, just called herself a prophetess. We have not even appointed her. When they told the pastor, patience, maybe he told them, let's be patient with everybody. God is still working on everybody. Nobody is perfect yet. And so you might have found that, you know, you know some of these people that have skill and ability and whatever it is, uh, they want to minister. Maybe it is our fault we're too slow and we have not appointed her. That's why, since she knows her skill and ability, that's why she jumped forward. Well, I will look into it. Let's be patient with her. Patience is good, but you can carry that patience too far. That when things are reported to you, that we say, this is not all right, this is not all right, well, we say, I understand, I understand, I understand. I will look into it, I will look into it. But don't let us hurt anybody. Let's be patient with people. Number two, I know your patience. Patience with problems. It's wonderful to be patient. Wonderful to be patient in your problem. When there is a problem, eh, there's a problem there, there's a problem there, there's a problem in that church. And we say, let's be patient. That's a good, good, good characteristic of a leader. Patient. Be patient with people. Be patient with problems. But don't carry it too far. Maybe when they came to the pastor and they said, Pastor, eh, eh, this problem we told you the other time. And you said you're looking into it. This woman, Jezebel, that calls herself a prophetess, she will not even allow the good women we appointed, the ones we know, the ones we know by the grace of God, we know they are born again, we know they are sanctified, and we know they are good, effective examples in this church. This woman is just taking the whole stage. I will not allow these other women that have been message, that have been ministry, to minister to these uh, people in the church. This Jezebel, look, in fact, Pastor, this thing is creating a problem. There are some young people now, whatever we say, they will not hear. They, they have to go to Mama, that is Jezebel, before they will hear what? Look into this thing. It's a problem already. Okay, I understand. I'm the pastor. Uh, problems will always be in the world. If you are too much aggressive, you want to solve all the problems in one day, you will have hypertension. I understand. I know it's a problem. We will look into it. Let's be patient with problems. My brother, my sister, you can carry that patience with problems. Carry that patience too far until something positive, which is good, which is patience, it becomes another sin, a great problem on the church. Be in the middle of the road and be balanced. Be patient, but deal with sin. Deal with evil before that evil becomes something uncontrollable that you cannot check. Deal with it at the right time. Jesus Christ said to this church, I know your patience. And then he says once again, I know thy works. And the last to be more than the first. The last to be more than the first. You see, this church, before revealing the trouble and the terrible corruption hidden behind the veil, and beneath their increasing activities and works, the Lord Jesus commended their charity, their service, their faith, their patience, and their works. And said they were even making progress because the last now was more than the first. 
The Lord is always quick to commend virtue anywhere it is found. But listen to me, brothers and sisters. Even though the Lord commends virtue anywhere it is found, he does not excuse damnable sin. Have you seen that woman by the well? Go and call your husband. I have no husband. You say right. Jesus commended her. But that does not mean she was born again, that she was all right completely. So Jesus said, because you have had five men, and the one you are living with now, you are living in adultery, she, he is not your husband. Jesus commended the truth that he saw in that woman, but that did not excuse the sin in her life. And then the man that turned to Jesus Christ and said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, oh, are you calling me good? All right, you know the law. Don't commit adultery. Don't commit, uh, don't uh, uh, covet, and don't uh, tell lies, and don't uh, bear false witness. And all this, oh, he said, all these things have I done since my youth. And Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. He commended him. He said, you appear very nice. But only one thing remains. If you are going to be perfect, here is what to do. He commended what was good there, the virtue. But he did not overlook the sin that the man still had to do. And then when he told him the price that he had to pay, so that he'll be able to enter into the kingdom of God, the man went away sorrowful. And then Jesus said, how hard it will be for those who are rich to enter into the kingdom of God. And you remember that man that came to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Lord Master, which is the great commandment in the law. And Jesus said, the great commandment in the law is here, O Israel, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. And then the man replied and said, Master, you have said well, because to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, you answered very well. When he saw, he answered discreetly. Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom. He praised him, but you are not there yet. Anywhere the Lord Jesus Christ sees virtue, sees something good, he will praise that virtue. But that doesn't mean that he excuses, he overlooks all the bad, bad things that need to be purged and corrected in our lives. Therefore, the Lord was telling this church that although I'm commending you for love and faith, out of which grew service and patience of perseverance, these are not enough if sin is not dealt with in a scriptural, authoritative manner. Love without holiness will descend into immorality. We must love. We must serve. We must be faithful with increasing perseverance. But the church must not be a hiding place for corruption of the leaven of immorality. Look at this. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 2 and verse 3. And you'll see the balance in the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. But... Do you see in verse 2, walk in love, walk in love, walk in love. And lest anybody will say love, love, love. Lest anybody will sing love, love, love. Lest anybody will carry it too far, love, love, love. It checks us immediately in verse 3. Walk in love. Love is good. Charity is good. Affection is good. But you balance it up. And you find the balance in verse 3. It says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, 
Let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. Can I challenge you to balance up your love in your church? Can I challenge you to remember that love without holiness will become sentimental, fleshly, immoral, and destructive? Can I challenge you and remind you that on the one hand, you have love. On the other hand, holiness. Match them together. So that the love does not cancel the holiness. And the holiness does not erase the love. I come to point number two, corruption. Through the perversion of Jezebel. Corruption. Through the perversion of Jezebel. Here we we'll come to it now, verse 20. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. Verse 23 to verse 23. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. I'm sure when the letter was being written to the church and being read to the church, and a person reading the church, the reader, when he came and told them, here is what the Lord Jesus has written unto you. This is the message of the Son of God unto you. And he started by saying, I know your works, I know your service, and I know your charity, and I know your patience. At that point, they were looking at one around, smiling. Oh, praise the Lord. Where, you know, things are commendable. Then all of a sudden, everything turned and everything changed, and it says... Here is what Jesus Christ is saying. Now, all he said about commendation is in only one verse. He has a lot to say in many verses to you from verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest, thou permittest, thou hast allowed that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. Now, as we preach this, I still must balance it up again. She called herself a prophetess. And many of you, I will say all of you, if not, if not, the very majority of your dear sisters, you didn't bring yourself here. You didn't uh, get crushed here. Uh, you, you have our approval. You have our understanding. You have our license. Our, our overseers, they know your life, they know you. So we're not talking about those good, wonderful sisters. This one we're talking about, she called herself a prophetess. This one was not appointed by the church. And this one was not brought into leadership by the church. And I know some of you dear sisters there, even when people that were less qualified than you are, when they were ministering. Now you know by the grace of God your life and you know that you could do better. You didn't jump into the position. You were patient, you were slow until uh, you allowed us to see the glory of God in your life and then we brought you in. And we thank God for what you've been doing since you came in. But this is talking about a Jezebel which called herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants. And to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto our idols. Here, we must understand now about this Jezebel because it dates back to the Old Testament. Actually, the Jezebel of the Old Testament lived about 918 years before Christ. She was the wife of Ahab and was a woman of vast, terrible influence upon a weak husband, an influence which was uniformly exerted for evil. And with the cooperation of a weak husband, Jezebel led the whole nation to idolatry, to sorcery, and to immorality. Let's look at the woman in the Old Testament to start with. That is this Jezebel, after which the woman in Tatira took uh, the character and the model and the thing she did. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings 
chapter 16. And let's see the, the first mention of this Jezebel. In 1 Kings chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 30. And he had the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had, it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of, of the Sidonians, and went and sat Baal and worshipped him. Uh, he married Jezebel, and Jezebel came from the background of worshipping the idol called Baal. That's what introduced Baal worship into the land of Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 18, I'm reading verse 4. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. For it was so, when Jezebel caught off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Uh, this woman was so terrible. She had a plan. And she said, if I allow the prophets of God teaching the law of God in the land. And I'm also introduced Baal. And I'm introducing and raising up false prophets that will teach the people Baal worship. This, it will be too slow for Baal worship to cover the land. Therefore, what I will do, I will not even say I'm silencing those prophets. I will not say I want to imprison them. The only thing to do is to cut them off, destroy them, kill them. And that Jezebel, so cruel and so wicked, killed many of the prophets of God. And do you know who, is, uh, who you can refer to as Jezebel? Any woman not appointed by the people of God. Or maybe they were appointed by the people of God, but it was a great, great, great mistake to bring them into leadership in the church. And all they want to do by their cruel, wicked, violent, Influence is to silence the people of God that are preaching the truth. That's Jezebel. In verse 13, chapter 18, verse 13, Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I, I, I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? Chapter 19. In chapter 19, uh, there was one prophet that remained, the prophet of fire, that vocal prophet, that mighty prophet, that dynamic prophet, that prophet that not even Ahab could make him afraid, that prophet that took on for 50 prophets of Baal and destroyed them, that prophet of fire that said, the God that answers by fire, him shall we serve. And then he prayed at the time of the evening sacrifice, and fire fell down, and a revival broke out in the whole nation, and the people said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. But this Jezebel was so mighty and powerful that that national prophet that was able to shake a nation, this woman shook that man Elijah. That Jezebel was something, was something. And if you have any Jezebel like that in your church tonight, we're going to pray. Tonight, I'm, I'm not worried about time tonight because if there's any woman in your church that has the spirit of Jezebel tonight, we're going to deal with that spirit of Jezebel in that woman, cast out that spirit, render that Jezebel worthless and useless in your local church that if you have been afraid of that Jezebel when you go back the fire of the Lord burning in your eyes will scare that Jezebel either she'll be converted or she'll run away from that church we didn't come here to play in this congress we came here and we mean business because there's some people that are hiding in our local churches let me, let me say this before I go on. When I was reading this and studying this, and when I say I study, when I say I study, I read the text, 
I read this commentary, read this commentary, then push everything aside, and then go back to it and study and study again. As I was studying, I asked myself, I said, the pastor in this church, he wasn't like Paul the Apostle. Because I just, I closed my eyes, and I imagined, and I brought Paul into Tyre. I said, Paul, do something. If you were the pastor there, what will you do? Ah, I know what you will do. Because you see that damn cell that was following after Paul and Silas and was saying these are the men of God that show us the way of salvation and she did that many days and then Paul all of a sudden he became grieved in his spirit and the Holy Ghost up and the Holy Ghost that is holy fire, holy flame, holy zeal, holy, zeal, holy passion came upon him and he turned around and he looked at that woman and said Come out of her, you unclean spirit, a Paul the Apostle, had been in this church where this Jezebel, a woman that had not been appointed by the people of God or by God, but called herself a prophetess. I know Paul would have dealt with that spirit and that Jezebel will not have had a root in that place. We'll do it tonight. All those uh, people that when we preach the truth, that they will hide in the corner like a Jezebel. And it will bring corruption and pollution. And in, underneath, under the carpet, they will be having their influence and their sorcery. And here we are. Where is the fire of the Holy Ghost? Where is the gift of the Spirit? Where is the power and the anointing? Where is the Pentecost of the Pentecostal church? It will stop tonight. And so, you say, Jezebel, look at chapter 19. In chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. And he had told Jezebel, weak man, weak man, Ahab, the king. He couldn't, he couldn't do anything about it himself. He has to go back home and tell Jezebel, the wife, because the wife was a wicked influence behind him. And was a wicked planner. And the brain behind him didn't have any brain of his own. And he had told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with that, how he had slain all the prophets of the soul. That's a false prophet. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also. You see, she believed in her gods, in her idols, in Baal so much, and said, let, let the gods do much more unto me, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. You know the story. That's why Elijah ran away. I mean, a woman that can chase Elijah out of town, that's more than more demon, being more demon possessed. You know Elijah that I'm talking about? I said, do you know Elijah I'm talking about? Fifty people came from the king with a captain. And Elijah was sitting on the mountain. And then the people said, Man of God, the king is looking for you. And Elijah did not want to go. He said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you, and your, you captain and the 50. And fire came and destroyed them. Elijah. And then another 50 with another captain went. Man of God, the king said we should bring you. If I'm a man of God, let fire come down and, and destroy you. And it happened. Elijah. That prophet of fire. Bold, authoritative, mighty. This single woman ran him out of town. And when there is a Jezebel like that today, in any assembly, no matter what we say at the conference here, no matter what we teach you at the Congress, no matter your consecration, no matter your commitment, no matter your effectiveness on the crusade field, no matter how many people are healed, how many people are delivered, if there is such a Jezebel, 
in your local church. You'll be weak and powerless and intimidated when you go back. Elijah, Elijah, this great mighty prophet, this single woman, ran him out of town. That's why we're serious about this tonight. And we want, we're, we're going to deal with this thing. Thank God, thank God we have all the time. Because it's not midnight yet, we still have time. I said we have time. Hey, those of you that never did digging deep, you will do it tonight. And if you are, uh, thank God you are not sleeping, you are not uh, staying on a window so that you fall down. Ushers, you see anybody sitting on something that will fall? I don't want any uticus tonight. I don't want anybody falling down and dying tonight because we're going to deal with this Jezebel. I said we're going to deal with this Jezebel. And you women, you are going to join us. I said you are going to join us. With your amen and the fire of the Holy Ghost within you. See, all those counterfeit women, is a single bad woman can make us to think that all the other women are bad, but you are not bad, you are good women. But the bad eggs and the black legs and the sorcerers and the sorceress or whatever they are or the witches or whatever and the Jezebels, there are very few, we're going to run them away from here. And so, she ran Elijah out of town. I'm sure you all, look at Second Kings. Look at Second Kings. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 9. Second Kings chapter 9, verse 22. In 2 Kings 9, 22, here is it now. It says, and it came to pass, when Joram saw Jehu, that he said, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, what peace, so long as the wardoms, the adultery, the fornication, the immorality, of thy mother, Jezebel, and her witchcrafts are so many. She also got into witchcraft. It wasn't just natural cruelty. It was a kind of cruelty backed by evil power, sorcery, witchcraft. And then it goes on to tell us in Bastati, look at Jezebel. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it and she painted her face. Did you hear me? Did you see it in your Bible? And Jezebel painted her face and tied her head and looked out at a window. You heard that? Then in verse 36, Therefore, wherefore, she came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which is spake by his prophet Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel, shall thus eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, this is Jezebel. And you will understand eventually she died a miserable death, a miserable death. What kind of death do you think such women will die? Evil and evil people thrive when good people are silent and tolerant of evil. Even they say it in the world. They say evil increases. Evil people increase when good people keep quiet. When good people are silent. And in the church in Tatira, when Jezebel was doing all those things, then the people of God, the leadership in the church, they kept quiet. And that's how to make evil increase. What the church was commended for faded away into insignificance before the threatening, corrupting influence of Jezebel. This Jezebel in the church in Tatira led real born again Christians, even some of the Lord's servants, into immorality and abominable practices of idolatry. Sin had continued long enough in that church, and the Lord had given even enough time to repent, but there was no sign of repentance at all. The time had now come that God, Jesus Christ himself said, judgment was coming. Terrible, earthly, and eternal judgment was coming upon Jezebel and all the people that Jezebel had influenced. 
All who had been led into sin and who had refused to repent will be judged severely. Hey, look at this revelation now. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 21, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. That's a bed of affliction, a bed of suffering, a, so a bed of divine indignation, a bed of eternal punishment. will sleep and will then will not wake up again. You'll taste of the second death, eternal death, eternal separation from God. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery will sign into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Look at the mercy of God. He gave them space to repent. They didn't repent. He threatened them with judgment, and he said, well, but there's still a chance if they will repent. And then he said, I will kill her children with death. Her children were dead. Her children were dead. What, what does that mean? That is, uh, the other people, the people that were referred to Jezebel as, that's our mother in the Lord. You don't respect the pastor? Only Jezebel? That's our mother in the Lord. Any message they hear, these ones will run to Jesus and say, Mama, Mama, what do you think about what they preach? Jesus will say, forget it, forget it. Those people are just uh, people that are emphasizing, Lord, do's and don'ts. Just, you know, let your let go. Let yourself go and just do whatever you want to be. Morality, fornication, go at it. It's all right. And whatever Mama Jezebel told them, that was all. That was all. That was all they accepted. Those were the children of Jezebel, the converts of Jezebel, the people that were under the influence of Jezebel in that church. And Jesus Christ said, What I'm going to do for them, I will kill our children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am He which know which such as the rays and the secrets of the of the soul of the spirit of the earth and the heart and i will give unto every one of you according to your works but unto you i say unto the rest in tatira as many as have not this doctrine which have not known the depths of satan as they speak i will put none other burden upon you uh, you see uh, the people were even saying that they knew the depths of Satan. They had secret knowledge. They had secret information. But punishment was coming on them. What was the command of God now? The promise of God for the people of God. That leads me to point number three. Point number three. Command and promise for the just. Here we are in Revelation chapter 2. From verse 25 now. For that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that has an ear, anybody there? He that has an ear, are you there? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We will hear in Jesus' name. And the Lord is telling us not to be uh, carried away with all those influences of Jezebel. Influences of, you know, it may not in your own church, it may not be a woman, it may be a man that is standing in the place of Jezebel, influencing people, corrupting people, polluting people, and having so much perversion, and may confusing them that they will not believe the word of God. Deal with it. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 35. Cast not away, therefore your confidence. That's what the Lord is saying. Hold what you have until the very end. Cast not away, therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, after that ye have done the will of God, that ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. The Lord is coming. Now the just shall live by faith. 
But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. We shall not draw back. Jezebel will not catch you. And the spirit of Jezebel will not have any place in your church. Because we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. The Lord is telling us to hold fast until he comes. We are going to hold fast. In 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 20 and verse 21. Oh, Timothy. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so called. Which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be unto you. Amen. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, the Lord warned us already that near the time of his coming, this kind of Jezebel spirit that will bring iniquity and sin will make many people to backslide and to lose their faith and to lose their first love. But by the grace of God, we shall stand. I said we shall stand. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, it says, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. How many people want to abide until the end? I said, how many people there want to abide until the end? The Lord is telling you, that which you have already, hold fast until I come. He is coming. I said he is coming. Don't let Jezebel take your crown. In this church, there are still some faithful believers. That is, in the church in Tartyra. And they had not yielded to the pressure of Jezebel or her agents. They had not accepted the doctrine and the powerful influence of Jezebel. They refused to know the depths of Satan as they speak. The depths of Satan, that means satanic delusions and devices. Diabolical mysteries and dangerous, deadly, devilish mysteries of Satan. The hidden mystery of iniquity. True. Standing believers were commanded then to remain free and separated from Jezebel's influence and to remain firm and steadfast and loyal to Christ to the very end. And then all those people that remain faithful, faithful in love, faithful in holiness, faithful in sound doctrine till the end, will reign with Christ in his eternal kingdom and will reign first with him in his millennial kingdom associated with Christ on earth in doctrine and in deeds, faithful to the end, they will then have dominion with Christ in his coming kingdom. I know that by the grace of God I will be there. You will be there. Rise up and tell the Lord. Have you discovered that spirit of Jezebel? Intimidating preachers. Making preachers afraid to tell the truth. And to preach all that they know. And then when you see those people in your congregation. You tremble and your mouth, your lips will begin to shiver. And uh, you will not know what to say. You begin to stammer. You cannot pronounce again the word holiness because of that Jezebel there. You're so much afraid of her. You're so much afraid of her followers, of her children, of her agents. But tonight, you want to have power, authority over all those Jezebels in your congregation. And you want to stand firm. And stand firm to the very end. That you will not allow that self-appointed Jezebel to destroy this great work, this good work that the Lord himself has established. You will not allow, you will not allow a man or a woman, no matter what he profess to have, magical power, witchcraft, sorcery, 
eloquence, money, beauty, connections, whatever it is they have, you stand against them. You stand against every spirit of Jezebel. You are not allow any spirit of Jezebel to destroy the great work, the good work, the marvelous work that the Lord has put in your hand. Deal with it. Deal with it. You have a commission. You have a commandment. You have the anointing of the Lord upon your life. You have a ministry that the Lord has given you. Don't allow Jezebel, self-appointed woman leader, anywhere to hinder the progress of the work in your hand. Don't let them destroy the standard that God has helped you to build over the years. Stand against them. Cast out that evil spirit in them. Be like Paul the Apostle. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost and the passion of the Holy Ghost and the seal of the Lord move you, move you so that all those Jezebels that are thinking they are going to change you. They are going to change the church. They are going to change the doctrine. Let the fire begin to burn. Let the fire begin to burn. Let the fire begin to burn. That they will not feel convenient. And the fire will burn, will burn, will burn, will burn in their families. And the evil spirit that they swallowed, they have to vomit that evil spirit. No Jezebel will hinder the great work of God. God has given you to do in this church. Don't run away from them. Don't leave the church for them. Don't allow them to do just whatever they want. Dress the way they want. Talk the way they want. And be in any meeting they want that nobody can control them. Cast that evil spirit out of that Jezebel in that church. And all those that are not Jezebel yet... But they are developing, they are developing, they are developing, they are developing that spirit of Jezebel. Look at them straight in the face and cast out that evil spirit out of them. Great I see that is in you. Great I see that is in you. That he that's in the world, don't let any Jezebel come out of the world there and come into the church and then pollute. Pollute. The grace of God, the work of God that the Lord has put in your hand. Stand against them. Cast out that evil spirit. Run them out. Don't let them run you out of the church of the living God. Don't let Jezebel control your message. Don't let Jezebel control your conviction. And don't allow Jezebel free time, liberty, to just remain in the local church. Confront her. Confront her. Go to her directly. Deal with that thing right there. Don't allow any Jezebel to have free chance, liberty to just do anything, say anything, influence people anyhow. Go at it. Deal with it immediately. The anointing of the Lord is upon you. The power of the Lord is upon your life. The fire of the Holy Ghost is burning within your soul. Deal with that thing.
if their human spirit is so stubborn, I but the Holy Ghost in you. Cannot the Holy Ghost in you conquer the human spirit in them? Is Jezebel so strong the Holy Ghost cannot deal with her? Is Jezebel so mighty, so strong, the fire, the fire, the fire of the Holy Ghost cannot burn all that witchcraft out of her life? A weapon that is mighty, able to destroy strongholds. Is that Jezebel so strong and so mighty and so deep rooted in that church that the power and the instrument that is spiritual, mighty, able to destroy stronghold, cannot uproot all the influence of that Jezebel in your local church, get her out of that place. This is not a night to sleep. This is a night to call upon the Lord. Let your mind go back home. Let your mind go back home. Remember, remember, remember those Jezebels in your local church. Remember those Jezebels in your local church. As you are pulling, as you are building on the pulpit, they are cheering down, they are cheering down, they are cheering down in the private. And you have been quiet. And you have been afraid. And you have been intimidated. And you couldn't deal with them. And you are avoiding them. Tonight is the night to deal with them. Deal with that Jezebel in your local church. Run her out of that church by your prayer, by the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. Come on now, raise your voice and talk to the Lord and command that spirit in Jezebel. Come out in Jesus' name. Jezebel can destroy everything you have built by their sorcery, by their witchcraft, by their worldliness, by their evil influence, by their false doctrine, by their insinuations, by their deception. And that spirit that is walking in them will not be tired. They'll be going from house to house. They'll be going from person to person. They'll be going from member to member, destroying the work of God that God has helped you to establish. Cast out that evil spirit of Jezebel from that church and stand, and stand, and stand. At the door of the church, stand right there. Stand right there. And let the fire of God, with a flame in the eyes of Jesus, burn through your eyes and scare those Jezebels away from there. Deal with it tonight. Deal with it tonight. Don't let that spirit of Jezebel transfer sleep into your eyes. You women, you are doing a great work in your women ministry. But one Jezebel can hide in a corner and destroy the great or the good work that you women ministry that you are doing. If you are not careful, so you women, you stand against that spirit of Jezebel too. You anointed women. 
you are appointed women, appointed by the Lord and confirmed by the church. We know you. We know you are, you are doing the great work of God. But I may be one Jezebel there, hiding in the corner, that will destroy the women ministry that God has placed in your hand. Stand against women. Stand against women. Stand against the spirit of Jezebel in your local church. Don't let them destroy the good work God has put in your hand. Pastor, don't befriend Jezebel. Don't entertain Jezebel. Pastor, leader, overseer, don't become so much of a coward and timid and fearing and putting your hands at the back and bending to every Jezebel, bowing to every Jezebel in your local church. Stand against her spirit. Conquer that spirit. Conquer that spirit. Conquer that spirit. If they are stubborn against the truth, let the Holy Ghost in you make you stubborn against all their wiles, all their strategies, all their methods. If they are stubborn by the power of the devil, you become stubborn then in the power of the Holy Ghost against all the evil they are doing. Stand. Have conviction. Be courageous and be strong in the Lord. Don't allow any Jezebel to destroy this great work, this great work, this great work. Stand firm. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, You have the victory tonight. You have the victory in your life. All the fear, all the timidity, cringing and compromising and fearing Jezebel. I don't know what they will do. And they want to run you out of town. I transfer the fear in your heart to the heart of Jezebel. Your enemies will run for you. Jezebel will run away from your church. You'll be bold as a lion. And the conviction, the power of the Holy Ghost will be so mighty in you. That next time when you stand on your pulpit and you just look straight like this, Jezebel, if he's there, she will tremble. She will tremble. She will tremble. And either she will get converted or she'll be cast out of that church. Raise up your hand of victory. Women, raise up your hand. Women, I want to pray for you now. Women, we appreciate what the Lord is doing through you. Women ministry in this church will really appreciate. But then, the canker worm of Jezebel spirit that may want to destroy the good work of the women in this church, we're going to stand against it. Women, I'm praying specially for you that the spirit of Jezebel will not conquer you. That you, you'll be mighty in the Lord in Jesus' name. And your husband, some of your husbands, they are pastors. Some of your husbands, they are overseers. And some of these Jezebels will go behind you when you are not there. And they will be looking as if they are friendly. They want to destroy your husband. And they want to destroy the ministry of your husband. And they want to make your husband a piece of bread, a lifeless uh, somebody. They want, you, they want shame, the shame of adultery, the shame of fornication to come upon your husband and to come upon you and to come upon the family that you don't know where to put your leg anymore because the spirit of Jezebel overpowered your husband. I'm going to deliver your husband. That all that spirit of Jezebel that will destroy your own ministry and destroy the ministry of your husband, God will crush and cancel and destroy the spirit of Jezebel from that congregation in Jesus' name. Are you single brothers and sisters, the anointing of God upon your life the goodness of God upon your life. 
and there is a Jezebel that has seen that. And because of that, they want to come through a cracked wall and then have an influence upon you that then spiritually you'll be lukewarm, you'll be sleeping. And you that was mighty before, you that was dynamic before, you that you, you were a great a giant before, and the Lord was preparing you to be a giant, then the spirit of Jezebel will come, will come, and then crawl in. They want you to marry them. And once you marry Jezebel, you are gone. Your life is gone. Your ministry is gone. Everything is finished to you. But tonight, you will conquer that spirit of Jezebel in Jesus' name. Keep up your Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you tonight because you have given us this message. I come against the spirit of Jezebel that will destroy the good work of the appointed, anointed women in this church. Oh Lord, I trash, I, tr I trample upon that spirit of Jezebel in Jesus' name. Strengthen our good women. Strengthen our converted women. Strengthen our consecrated women. That the work you are putting in their hand will succeed in Jesus' name. That spirit of Jezebel in any local church represented here tonight, I cast you out. I destroy you. And all those people that have been operating with the spirit of Jezebel, I call you to conversion right now. I pray that the fire of conviction will burn in your soul and you'll get on your knees and you'll repent and turn away from all the sins in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for our men who are here, families who are here, that the spirit of Jezebel wants to conquer them, wants to catch them, wants to make them fall. That spirit of Jezebel, I command you, come out in Jesus' name. And any of the men there that have gone into their traps, I set you free. I break the chains on your feet. I break the chains on your heart. Be set free and be loose in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for the single brothers and the single sisters. Those who are marching in the way of righteousness. Of the Holy Ghost living in them and empowering them to be a dynamic minister of the gospel, even though they are single. But then there are some Jezebels that want to come and put them in a trap. I want to suck out the power, the divine energy in them. Lord, I pray, you deliver these as single brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. That when it comes to the point of deciding to get married, they will not marry anyone with the spirit of Jezebel. They will not marry anyone that will destroy their consecration, or destroy their lives, or destroy their ministries. Preserve your people in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that your umbrella, your blanket of protection will be upon this whole church. This whole church as deeper life Bible church. That the spirit of Jezebel will not have an inroad into this church. That all those self-appointed Jezebels that are trying to change the standard of the word of God. Trying to pollute this pure water of the gospel. And try to adulterate the sound doctrine of the word of God. And they're using all kinds of methods and powers. I take authority over them. Destroy their power in Jesus' name. Weaken them. Lord, weaken them. Lord, weaken them. Make that spirit walking in them to fall and never to rise again in Jesus' name. And let the people of God in this church, the ministers of God in this church, the overseers and the pastors in this church, the women leaders and the men leaders in this church, the coordinators and general leaders in this church, make us mighty, make us strong. Let the spirit of a giant and the spirit of a conqueror and the spirit of a champion of a giant be upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Lord, we will not run anymore. But Jezebels will run away from us. Strengthen your church. Empower your church. Protect your church. Put in us your fire and your power. That will go from strength unto strength. From faith to faith. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. 
In Jesus' name we pray. The church is marching on. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching on. We're marching on. The church is marching on. The church is marching on. And the gates of hell. We are marching on, the church is marching on. The church is marching on. Yes, the gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching. We are marching on, the church is marching on. The church is marching on. Yes, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching. We are marching on. 